Most of us don't know that we don't know who we are because many of us have allowed a fragment to lay claim to the whole of our identity by taking over our sense of self in terms of who we want to think we are, how we want to perceive ourselves in the world, and how we present. So what would it look like if we took off the mask of our personality, our persona, and found our way home to our true essence, our soul's created purpose for being? It was 20 years ago in a slum in Cambodia that I first came across the teaching that gave clarity to this question and subsequently to its answer. That's when I first found the Enneagram. I came to understand that the Enneagram reveals to us the nine ways that we get lost or disconnected from our essence, the nine ways that we stay stuck in this lostness, and the nine ways that we attempt to find our way home. Essentially, the Enneagram exposes to us our ego set of coping addictions that we've wrapped up around a so-called childhood wound so that we don't have to tell ourselves the truth about who we really are. You see, many of us would prefer to believe the fortifications around the projection of our own ego's mythology. We would prefer to believe this illusion is a substitute for our essence because you see, it's easier to surrender to the malformation of our truest self by giving in to what it is that we want to be seen as how it is that we want to be known, or how it is that we want to be loved. But what would it look like if we found the courage to say yes to ourselves, to surrender to the truest parts of who you are, and to free fall into your essence, allowing everything to belong? So what is the Enneagram? Essentially, the Enneagram of personality maps the nine fundamental archetypes of human character structure. It maps the nine paths of suffering that on a subconscious level we give ourselves over to and then we follow these paths of suffering. We put on these masks of our persona and we surrender to these ego set of coping addictions, allowing them to become the pre-conscious rails for our personality. Now, this teaching may be ancient with alleged evidence showing up over 7,000 years ago in ancient Egypt, 4,000 years ago in prehistoric Korea, over 3,000 years ago with the early Greek mathematicians and Pythagoreans. In fact, one of my teachers, the Jewish mythologist Michael Goldberg, suggests that at least implicitly, if not explicitly, the Enneagram shows up in Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey. Well, it was just 100 years ago, just a little over 100 years ago, that a controversial Greek-Armenian esoteric teacher, George Gurdjieff, introduced this at his Institute for the Harmonious Development of Humanity in France. He primarily only taught it through bodywork and dance and didn't teach it as a personality system. In fact, Gurdjieff said that if you were left alone in the desert to die and you sat there in the sand drawing the symbol over and over and over again, that you could see into it everything that has been taught and everything that could be learned. So let's fast forward for a quick second. In 1971, 72, and 73, the late Chilean Gestalt psychoanalyst, Dr. Claudio Naranjo, gathered small groups of graduate students in his backyard and in his living room. And over the course of those three years, they began to trick out Enneagram types, really mapping the addictive rails of our personalities patterns. Dr. Naranjo had just learned this a couple years earlier himself in the deserts of Chile from a Bolivian wisdom teacher by the name of Oscar Chasso. Well, it wasn't long after Naranjo and his students developed Enneagram of personality rails that the Jesuits in Loyola at Chicago began disseminating this, maybe a little too soon, and it was actually as recently as 1984, that the very first book on the personality overlay was published. So let's take a quick stroll around this color wheel of personality, these nine archetypes of human character structure, and try to locate ourselves. All right. We'll start with type one. Type one is sometimes called the performer, the perfectionist. This is the need to be perfect. And this person has this intrinsic and fundamental fear that they are irredeemably flawed, that they are morally corrupt. And so they strive in their idealism to live into these unrealistic expectations of goodness. And you can imagine that leads to tremendous inner resentment towards themselves, which you know this. In nine different ways, we internalize what we project. We perfect it in here, and then we share it with everybody else in the world. Poor ones sort of suffer this emotional passion that's traditionally been called anger, and we know that ones aren't the angriest people. We know that anger is a disguised form of sadness, and so there's a deep suffering in the heart of the one, that the world could be better, that the world should be better, and if I can't actually live into my sense of goodness, then how does anyone else have a chance? 
If you're one, you know this. You're incredibly principled. You're responsible. You follow through with, with what you say you're going to do, and you maintain high standards in every aspect of your life. But if you're one, you also know this. You're a source of peace and serenity, uh, of rootedness and groundedness. Type two, this is the need to be needed, sometimes called the helper or the giver. This is the heart forward embrace of the Enneagram. These are the great lovers of human character structure. They know what we need before we need it, and they're already there to help meet those needs. They're sensitive. They're emotionally intelligent. They're attuned. But there's a deep sadness in the heart of the two that denies their own needs, that is triggered by shame when some of us show up to actually love them in the ways that they want to be loved. You see, they perceive themselves as the source of love. But you know this. We can only take someone as far as we've gone them ourselves. And for the twos, you can only love us as deeply as you've learned to love yourself. And so there's an invitation to enter into a, a deep solitude that is compassionate and attentive to your needs. And the more that you do that, the more that you will realize that your embrace for each and every one of us is the extension of your embrace for yourself. Type three. Type three is sometimes called the need to succeed. And that actually bums me out because the name that's often given to the three is sometimes the achiever or, or the performer. And if you're a three, you know this. It's actually not about success or failure because it's always been about your relationship to value, your intrinsic value, the sense that you think that you have to earn it to make yourself lovable. And look, fundamentally, that's what the Enneagram is all about. It's the nine ways that we want to be loved. It's the nine ways that we suffer not getting the love that we want. And it's the nine ways we act out of the pain of that. If you're a three, you see value in everything. And you add that, you ascribe that. You, you make everything that you touch better. You will accomplish actually everything that you want. There's this ache in the heart of the three that often you're trying to realize the unfulfilled dream or dreams of a parent or caregiver, to ascribe value even to them. But you see, there's a need to enter into your own empty, shattered heart, to learn to love yourself, to realize that value and love are things that cannot be earned, but they are intrinsically ascribed. And when you say yes to yourself, you become a source of hope in the world. And not only a source of hope, a source of healing. Right? Type four. This is the need to be unique, sometimes called the romantic or the tragic romantic or the individualist, right? When we're in a room like this, I say, how many fours in the room? And no matter how many hands are raised, if you're a four, you actually think you're the only four because you're actually that different. You're actually that unique and exceptional. There, there really is no one like you. And, and the suffering in the heart of the four comes from this fear that I don't know from where I came. I don't know where to ground and root my sense of identity. And so there's a self-abandonment narrative constantly at play in the back of your heart, which leads to tremendous ache. And for the fours, they can drop into the pain of this. If you're a four, you see significance and meaning in everything. But the tragedy is you can't find it in yourself. And so as you're looking for outside of yourself, the invitation is to turn inward, to stop longing and fantasizing and imagining that everyone else has a better life or a more satisfying relationship or a deeper sense of vocational fidelity than you. Because simply saying yes to yourself roots you in the gift of your equanimity, that you are neither extremes of your emotions, but that you are grounded, rooted in the present because you are loved. Type five, right? Don't sleep on our fives. I love fives. One of the most misunderstood types in the Enneagram. This is the need to understand. Sometimes called the observer or the investigator. I, I love it in Spanish. They, they sometimes call it the theorist. This is the person who moves in and up into their mind palace and, and really is among the most boundary of all the personality structures here. They need space. They need to calculate the expenditures of their energy because it's not that they're withdrawing. It's not that they're, 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 they're stingy. It's that they care so much about the people that they've included in their life that they want to establish stability, security, and safety by getting to the answers of everything. But you see, for the five, it's actually less about the answers and it's more about the right question. And so fives are incredible 
seekers of truth, explorers of knowledge. And as incredible as your mind works, and, and as much as you may love to be a learner, you, you know this if you're a fighter, teachers actually slow you down. And so you have very little time and, and very little patience for the things that are the distractions to your pursuit for solutions. But when you learn to let those go, in, in, in the truest sense of non-attachment, that's where we follow your heart to some of the most generous expressions of human personality. Type six, this is the need to be secure. Sometimes called the skeptic. If you're a six, your arms are folded, you're watching me saying this is made up. Well, yes, somebody made it up. I don't believe in this until we get to six and then we break down sixes and it's like brain blown. Okay, back to I don't believe in this. There's a, a, a threat forecasting energy in the mind of the six that, that, that keeps the rest of us safe. They're worst case scenario thinkers, contingency planners. They double down on their fears so that we don't have to. And that's one of the ways that they actually love us. But man, what a hard mind and heart to have to live with. They're misunderstood as pessimistic because when they lead with concern, their concern is care. And when we learn to listen to that, we learn to receive the love from them. But when the six learns to trust themselves rather than exporting their authority to an external source of strength, you become a, a source of courage and strength and faith unlike anyone. And we will follow you anywhere. Sevens. Sevens are the need to avoid pain, the enthusiasts, the up and out energy. They're, they're, they're imaginative, they're, they're, they're curious, they're, they're playful. There's a kind of forever young heart and the psychic structure of the seven, and it's contagious. We want to go with them. We want to be on vacation from our problems because fundamentally, the seven is running from the pain in their own heart. It almost seems too overwhelming, almost suffocating. And so rather than going inward, the seven goes out. They may be the fastest thinkers of the Enneagram, the most incredible problem solvers. And, and, and so, yes, if they're sleeping during a staff meeting at the very end, they have the solutions, they're probably right. But for the seven, the invitation is to learn to practice presence, to lay down these addictions of preoccupation, of planning, of future forecasting, and say yes to the source of your own essence, which is to be a gift of freedom in the world. Because when you're free, we'll all know what it's like to be free. Now type eight, I'm guilty here. This is the need to be against. Sometimes called the challenger or the contrarian. This is the person who hates bullies but may come across as the biggest bully. One of my friends has told me that eights may not be as tough as they come across, but they are mean and meaner than we imagine. Because the mental fixation here is vengeance. And so you can't punish an eight harder than they'll punish themselves when they realize what they've done to hurt somebody that they care for. Eights use sass, hassle, and conflict to build trust because there's this betrayal narrative in the back of their minds that if they do open their hearts to somebody, uh, eventually that person will betray them. And, and so their inappropriate jokes, their lewd language, their, 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 their foul temper is, is a way for them to stomp on the ice between you and them to see what is it going to take to break that ice so that we can get this betrayal out of the way now. For the eight, there's an invitation to, to, to allow your inner child, your innocence to come forward. And when an eight says yes to themselves, there may not be a more tender person on this color wheel of personality structure. Type nine, right? This is the need to avoid. These are sometimes called the, the, the mediators or, or the peacemakers. There's this fear of fragmentation that wrecks the mind and the heart of the nine. And so rather than going inward to harmonize their own disconnected, fragmented view of self, they establish peace in the world as a way of distracting. And like I said, we all do this in nine different ways. We internalize and project what we then project, which are constant distractions from our return to innocence. Nines have this sort of self-forgetting energy. Nines have this sort of self-minimizing way of misunderstanding love. And so in their early holding environments, they made what was important to their family members or their community more important than it should have been by making what was important to them small. 
And so for a nine, stepping into the fullness of who you are, stepping into the fullness of you being a source of love is your part in helping heal the world. And really, that's what's at stake here. That each of us have a piece of the puzzle. That each of us bring one of these little keys, one of these little elements, one of these little aspects to helping create the new we that our hearts long to be included in. So, hopefully that super duper brief run around that color wheel at least gives you the sense that these Enneagram type structures actually allow for us to chart the unexplored interior landscape of our ego. That the Enneagram allows us to move beyond the caricatures of our personalities, our quirks and eccentricities, and actually accept ourselves for who we really are. Learning to put this teaching to work requires that, yes, we cultivate an honest relationship with ourselves. That we come to realize that until we can self-observe, we cannot self-correct. And that fundamentally, if any part of ourself doesn't belong, then truthfully, no part can fully belong. Rather than being a teaching for self-absorption, the Enneagram is a sacred map for self-liberation. So may we come to embrace this sacred teaching May we come to the embrace the Enneagram is a compassionate sketch of possibilities for who we can become when we say yes to ourselves, allowing the totality and the entirety of who we are to belong. 